So today we're finishing off uh, our series on the book of Daniel. So we're looking at the last three chapters, but we're not going to read it all. <laughs> and I particularly want to look at how the whole book ties together, how we make sense of it. The Bible is God revealing himself to us and revealing his big salvation plan. And he does this through individual people's lives and through his nation, Israel slash Judah. God's faithfulness to individuals and their faith, faithfulness to him, as we see with Daniel, encourages deeply, but that's not the whole story. And we need to ask, what is this part of God's word telling us about him and about his big salvation plan? Because that's the perspective these ch chapters take. Have you seen an Ando painting? Have a look at this. Dave, can we have just that first partial pick, please? Any idea who or what <laughs> that might be? Um, when we look at it up close without the bigger picture, we've really got no idea. How about now with the big picture? Dave? When we come at it from the right perspective, it makes sense. And the strange bits in, of Daniel, the weird beast, and especially these last three chapters, are a bit like that. We need to step back and look at the bigger picture. So what is the big picture? Uh, here's a lightning trip through Daniel so far, focusing on God. So Daniel 1, God controls nations. He handed Judah over to Babylon. Daniel 2, God knows the future of those nations. If you remember the statue, um, about four different uh, empires, they'll be destroyed, but God will set up an eternal kingdom that will crush all human kingdoms. Daniel 3, the fire episode, God controls the elements. Daniel's friends make a really crucial statement. The God we serve is able to deliver us, but even if he does not, we will not serve your gods. Now, that idea of, of that kind of faithfulness that might cost God's people their lives comes up again in the last three chapters. It's crucial at the end of the book. Lots of threads from earlier in the book tie together in these last chapters. Daniel 4, God humbled the very proud Nebuchadnezzar and then restored him. Daniel 5, the writing on the wall. What God says will happen, will happen. Daniel 6, Darius asks a key question. Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God been able to rescue you from the lions? Is God able to rescue? Of course he is. He's able. And his miraculous rescue of Daniel shows that. The events, the miracles of the first six chapters provide evidence to back up the claims about the future that God makes in the last six chapters. When we come to Daniel's dream, chapter 7, there are terrifying and powerful rulers and kingdoms and they will come and go. But the ancient of days, God the Father, sits on his throne and the Son of Man will come on the clouds of heaven. Chapter 8, we had the ram and the goat and Antiochus Epiphanes. No matter how wicked human rulers are or how much havoc they wreak, God sets their limits. Chapter 9, Daniel's prayer of confession on behalf of himself and his people. We have sinned, he said, and done wrong. We have rebelled. They had broken the covenant and suffered the just punishment. But God had also promised they'd go back to the promised land and that return was about to start. 
that land, Israel, was meant to be a land of blessing, wholeness and peace. But as the people were starting to return, God was warning them, it wasn't going to be like that for the next few centuries. Trouble was coming, nasty rulers, persecution. They would need faith like Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. God can rescue us, but even if he does not, we will not bow down to any other God. So the book's last three chapters pick up all of these ideas. And the next few hundred years would be bleak for God's faithful people. But these chapters, as confusing as they can seem, hold out hope. God has set his limits on these evil human kingdoms and their rulers. He will destroy them and bring in his eternal kingdom true justice, true peace, true rescue. God's faithful people look forward to resurrection, rising to life with him. Even though we might kind of love the first half of Daniel and sort of want to run screaming from the second half, Daniel is all one book and it has one main idea running through the lot. God's in charge and he wins. That's a message of deep comfort for us if we look at our world and feel like despairing. COVID, Afghanistan, Haiti. What are these last three chapters about? Same as the rest of the book. God's in charge and he wins. And if we're faithfully on his side, we will ultimately win too. These chapters show us a kind of God's eye view of human history. Turmoil, rise and fall of nations, and then the coming of God's kingdom. So last week, Dave talked about Daniel's prayer. That was the first half of chapter nine. The rest of chapter nine is actually God's answer to Daniel's prayer. And we have a slide for this one, please. So Daniel 9, 20 to 21, and then 24. While I was speaking and praying, confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and making my request to the Lord my God for his holy hill, that is Zion, Jerusalem, while I was still in prayer, Gabriel, the angel, came to me and instructed me. So as soon as Daniel started to pray, God was answering. Verse 24, 77s are decreed for your people and your holy city to finish transgressions, to put an end to sin, to atone for wickedness, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy place. And the angel goes on to say that Jerusalem will be rebuilt. It was and to predict that an abomination that causes desolation would be set up. It was. Here he talks about 77s, and in the next verse, in verse 25, he talks about 62 sevens. It's all a bit weird for us, and scholars don't agree about it. When we come to bits like this where we think, what on earth? <laughs> Look for what is clear. God was revealing there is a fixed time set by him. God's in charge and he wins. But look again at verse 24. Sorry, Dave. <laughs> at this certain time, what will happen? Putting an end to sin, atoning for wickedness, bringing in everlasting righteousness. Who does that remind you of? Jesus. As Daniel prayed in confession and for Israel to be restored to her land, God answered him with words that we recognise pointed forward to Jesus, God's ultimate answer. Jesus achieved some of these things when he came to earth the first time like atoning for wickedness, atoning for sin. 
Some of them will happen through Jesus when God's kingdom comes fully and finally, bringing in everlasting righteousness. And this foreshadowing of Jesus here is important context for what comes next because these last chapters essentially cover the time between Daniel, broadly 500 BC, and the coming of the Messiah, Jesus' birth. God was warning his people about events that would impact them over that 500 or so years. I'm just going to sample and summarise some bits because there's a lot <laughs> in three chapters. So in chapter 10, Daniel had another vision which left him basically a quivering mess. And God's messenger, though, reassured him and told him, I have come to explain to you what will happen to your people in the future. Plain as day, this was about Judah's future. Now, this second vision happened in Cyrus's third year. This is all two years after Daniel's prayer in chapter 9, and it's after some people had already returned to Judah. Here's a sample of um, what the rest of chapter 10 and all of chapter 11 is like, and we're going to have someone read that for us, please. So this is Daniel 11, 2 to 6. The kings of the south and the north. Now then I tell you the truth. Three more kings will arise in Persia, and then a fourth, who will be far richer than all the others. When he has gained power by his wealth, he will stir up everyone against the kingdom of Greece. Then a mighty king will arise who will rule the great power and do as he pleases. After he has arisen, his empire will be broken up and parceled out toward the four winds of heaven. It will not go to his descendants, nor will it have the power he exercised, because his empire will be uprooted and given to others. The king of the south will become strong, but one of his commanders will be even stronger and he and even stronger than he and will rule his own kingdom with great power. After some years, they will become allies. The daughter of the king of the south will go to the king of the north to make an alliance, but she will not retain her power and he and his power will not last. In those days, she will be betrayed together with her royal escort and her father and the one who supported her. Thank you. You did a great job. That's not easy. <laughs> and even for us as adults, we kind of go, what do we make of that? It sounds a bit, you know, like gobbledygook in a lot of ways. Here's the gist of these two chapters because most of Chapter 10 and all of Chapter 11 are like that. It's the same stuff, different details, but the same kind of idea. So here's the gist. First of all, there are lots of details about various countries. The king of the south is the king of Egypt. There's the king of the north. There's one who defies God. The bottom line is we can see from history that these things mostly happened between Daniel's time and Jesus' birth. Most of these prophecies were fulfilled by the time Jesus was born. It can sound like gobbledygook to us, but these chapters describe historical events. When you look at the overall picture that this vision paints, you can see these human kingdoms were characterised by tyranny, intrigue, deception, human pride, people grasping power, invasion, destruction, evil and defiance of God. That's what powerful human kingdoms are like. But in Daniel's time, Judah wasn't one of those powerful nations. Why did they need to know about other countries? God's people weren't a kingdom in their own right anymore. They were a small sub-province called Yehud. 
So why did God bother to tell them the future of powerful nations like Egypt? It takes a chapter and a half. It's clearly important. Geographically, Judah was stuck in the middle between the Mediterranean on one side and the desert on the other, between Egypt in the south and powerful nations in the north. And typically, when those nations were trying to fight each other, their armies stomped through Israel on their way to whack another nation. Whatever was happening on a world scale would impact God's people, who were always caught in the middle when these armies funneled through. And then, of course, there were also times when they were the direct targets of invasion and persecution. God's people were going back to the promised land, but they were going to be invaded, persecuted, or even just collateral damage. The big nations wrangled with each other, wrangling with each other, would matter to God's people in the next few centuries. Some of them, many of them, would die in the process. Now, as I said, most of these details were historically fulfilled, but there are some, pl some places in these chapters where the details go beyond what we know from history. You might remember two weeks ago, Alex spoke about Antiochus Epiphanes. Chapter 11 returns to him with more details, but by verse 36, the prophecy sort of morphs into a description that doesn't apply to Antiochus. The historical details don't fit. It's now talking about someone else. And what we get in chapter 11 is really a picture of an evil ruler like Antiochus, but even worse. The New Testament name for that kind of figure is the Antichrist. In fact, the New Testament talks about antichrists, a whole string of evil rulers like Antiochus who will come and go and come and go. Evil tyrants who persecute God's people and go against everything good. And we can see shadows of them in our time in people like Hitler. In the early chapters, we saw the rise and fall of nations. God was saying that's what happens to human kingdoms. They rise and fall at the time he's appointed. God's faithful people would have to live through all of this and would suffer. Can we have the next slide, please, Dave, 11.33? So those who are wise... Faithful people, that is, will instruct many, though for a time they will fall by the sword or be burnt or captured or plundered. When they fall, they'll receive a little help. Some of the wise will stumble so that they may be refined, purified and made spotless until the time of the end, for it will still come at the appointed time. So this whole section of Daniel is God saying to his people, yes, it's going to get bad, but I've got it in hand. About one of these nasty rulers, God says, he'll come to his end and no one will help him. Gone, finished. These antichrists will come to their end. They only rule, they only exist for the amount of time God's given them. So as God's people started to return home after their exile in Babylon, God was warning them there wouldn't always be that stunning, miraculous rescue. Some of them would die. He was warning them about the suffering they'd face over the next four or 500 years, forewarning them to strengthen them, stay faithful. For us, none of these wicked rulers should come as a surprise. Stay faithful. God can rescue, he's able, but even if he does not, 
don't bow down to other gods. Now, I think Jock is going to read chapter 12 for us, please. Can you pass me? Can you? Mm -hmm. Can you pass me, Daniel? Please. Maybe oh, I geez. need to. Maybe I need to read chapter twelve. <laughs> Would that work, Dave? That's all right. We um, Jock's just come come into my room, and he's going to read from here. We found a workaround. At that time, Michael, the great prince who protects your people, will arise. There will be a time of distress, such as has not happened from the beginning of nations until then. But that, but at that time, your people, everyone whose name is found written in the book, will be delivered. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake some to everlasting life, others to shame and, the, and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise will sh shine like the brightness of, heaven, of the heavens and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. But you, Daniel, roll up and seal the world's words of the scroll until the time of the end. Many will go here and there to increase knowledge. Then I, Daniel, looked and there before me stood two others, one on his bank, on this bank of the river and one on the opposite bank. One of them said to the man clothed in linen, who was above the waters of the river, how long will it be before these astonishing things are fulfilled? The man clothed in linen, who was above the water, waters of the river, lifted his right hand and his left hand towards, toward heaven. And I heard him swear by him who lives forever, saying, it will be for a time times and, and half a time, when the power of the holy people has been finally broken and all these things will be completed. I heard, but I did not understand, so I asked, my Lord, what will the outcome of all this be? He replied, go your way, Daniel, because the words are rolled up and sealed until the time of the end. Many will be purified, made spotless and refined, but the wicked will continue to be wicked. None of the wicked will understand, but those who are wise will understand. From the time that the daily sacrifice is abolished and the abomination that causes desolation is set up, there will be 1,290 days. Blessed is the one who waits for, for and reaches the end of the 1,335 days. As for you, go your way till the end. You will rest. And then at the end of, these de of the days, you will rise to receive your allotted inheritance. Thank you, Jock. Again, not an easy bit to read. Um, and funny numbers and stuff like that. <laughs> Basically, what's going on? Chapters 10 and 11 tell Judah what's in store for them. Chapter 12 broadens out the pers perspective. It looks beyond Jesus' birth to his return, the resurrection of the dead and the final complete coming of God's kingdom. Just like the rock from God back in chapter 2, if you remember it, hit the feet of that statue and destroyed the human kingdoms and brought in an eternal kingdom. And now in chapter 12, God warns that he won't always save through miracles but he has a purpose when his people suffer. Can we have the verses back, please, Dave, from 12.1? There'll be a time of distress unlike anything before it. 
But everyone whose name is written in the book, that is any of God's faithful old covenant people or anyone who believes in Jesus will be delivered. Not saved from fires, but resurrection to everlasting life. Verse 3, those who are wise, the faithful ones, will shine like the brightness of the heavens. And those who lead many to righteousness, in our case, who tell people about Jesus, like the stars forever and ever. Verse 6 asks, though, but how long will it be? It will be for a time, times and half a time. Again, a bit weird, but it's a limited time set by God. But God's kingdom won't come until the power of the holy people has been finally broken. God's people will be crushed. And Revelation says something similar about people who are martyred for their faith in Christ. Verse 8 asks, what will the outcome be? And verse 10 is the answer. Many will be purified, made spotless and refined. The time was coming when Jews would die for their faith under people like Antiochus. And chapter 12 tells us that pattern, the rise and fall of evil rulers and their persecution of God's people will continue until everyone is raised and stands before God's judgment seat. Now, maybe you're thinking, oh, gee, that's a happy message, isn't it? <laughs> God, couldn't you tell us something nice and comfortable? This message from Daniel was directly for the people of Judah, but it's for us too. What's our take-home message? First thing, be prepared. God wants us to be forewarned, not taken by surprise. God said to Judah, and he says to us, these things will happen. Stay faithful, cling to me. Staying faithful to Jesus costs our time, energy, pride, the right to run our own lives, to even choose what we do in a day. For some of our brothers and sisters, it means persecution, imprisonment, death. Even when Daniel got dragged off to a foreign land, he stayed faithful. Even when things happen to us, we're to stay faithful. Be prepared. Second point, look through grown-up eyes. We might have learnt some of these stories from Daniel in Sunday school, but we're not in Sunday school anymore. Through the book of Daniel, and especially these later chapters, God wants us to have a grown-up understanding of life and faith, the times we live in, his word, what will happen before his kingdom finally comes? There's a vision in Revelation 6, and the martyrs cried out to God, how long before persecution ends and we get justice? And God's answer was, wait. Wait until the full number of faithful people will be martyred. Many, many things won't be put right until Jesus returns and brings in God's kingdom. They just won't. Daniel teaches that. Revelation teaches that. We need to look through mature eyes. We're also to be humble but confident. How do we get our heads around all of this? By being humble but also confident. God's in charge he gets to call the shots. As I was listening this morning before service started, um, Dave played that song, his is the right to rule our life, my life. Mine is the joy to live for him. Right? God is in charge. He gets to call the shots. And we need to be humble before him. These verses say persecution purifies God's people, and we can understand that. 
But do we fully understand why God allows all this stuff to happen? No, I don't think we do. I certainly don't. But we acknowledge God is the sovereign Lord of the universe who rules over nations, the future, lions, fire, tyrants. God has the right to choose for us. When bad stuff happens, in humility, we submit to him and throw ourselves on him. And we can be absolutely confident he will put it right in his time. In his time, he will lift us up. In fact, he will raise us up because he is also sovereign over death. Be humble but confident. And keep going. Go your way, which we heard back in Chapter 8 and we hear it again now. Chapter 8, Daniel got up and went about the king's business. We live with the tension and the suffering of living in the middle. When Jesus came to earth, God's kingdom came near, but it will only be fully established when Jesus returns. In the middle, where it seems bleak, and right now it does, I think, but there's a precious, precious message of hope. For everyone whose name is found in the book of life, everyone who believes in Jesus, everlasting life. Daniel was told, go your way till the end. Keep going. You will rest and then at the end of the days you'll rise to receive your allotted inheritance. Your allotted inheritance. True for Daniel, true for us. As we go our way, we're to stay faithful what happen, whatever happens to us and around us, not worship gods that our society wants to thrust on us or gods of our own making, you know, the God I believe in would or would not do whatever. No. Our responsibility is clear, faithfulness, and our future is settled, everlasting life. Jesus is coming. Evil will end. God's kingdom is coming, bringing peace, justice, wholeness. In the meantime, we get on with all the ordinary things of life and sometimes extraordinary things, but we get on with it, telling people about Jesus, caring for our families, serving, working for our bosses. All of this is part of the life God's given us. Keep going. Because God's in charge and he wins. And if we're on his side, we win too. We have ultimate security. We might not be rescued from fire or persecution, but we will be delivered through resurrection. The world, despite appearances, is not spinning out of control. It's in God's control. That means we can hold on in the darkest days knowing God has a purpose and a plan. And we look forward to that coming day, the climax of God's salvation plan. Revelation 22, 3 to 5 says it this way, and I've substituted us where it says they because it applies directly to us. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city and his servants will serve him. This is in the new heaven and new earth. We will see his face and his name will be on our foreheads. There will be no more night. We won't need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun for the Lord God will give us light. And will reign forever and ever. This is the hope we see more clearly than Daniel ever could. We know Jesus the Messiah has come. He's died for us to rescue us and he'll come again. God's in charge and he wins. And if we're on his side, we will win too. Come, Lord Jesus. Let's just pray. 
Our great God and loving Father, we thank you that your victory is secure. We thank you that your kingdom is coming. We pray for your strength to rely on you in everything we face in the meantime. And we pray in Jesus' name.